In today's shipwreck video, we'll be looking to Germany, and to the High Seas Fleet in particular. Most of that fleet ended up interned in Scapa Flow, only to be scuttled by their own crew. A final act of defiance in the face of defeat. Some of those wrecks remain in that harbor to this day, picked at and partially broken up in the hunt for pre-atomic steel. Others were salvaged between the sinking and the Second World War. Today's video will look at one of those in the form of SMS Hindenburg, the last of Germany's battle cruisers and the best documented of the salvage operations. This is not a coincidence. Hindenburg sank up right, which made her the most visually interesting of the wrecks. It also, ironically, made her the most difficult to raise. It took multiple attempts and several years to get the Glossekreuzer to the surface. And in today's video, we'll look at that salvage, alongside the headache it caused the men doing the operation. That story begins with the scuttling, which is a pretty well-known topic, so I'll only briefly touch on it. On the morning of June 21st, 1919, the High Seas Fleet awoke to another day in internment. The majority of Germany's wartime fleet had been sitting in Scapa Flow for months by this point awaiting formal confirmation of their fate. It was pretty clear to all involved that it wasn't going to be in Germany's favor. The Germans were certainly not fond of the idea of giving up the ships, especially Admiral Ludwig von Reuter in command of the fleet. There is conflicting information on this topic. Some sources will say he was resigned to giving up the fleet, provided the German government agreed to those terms. If the government surrendered the ships, so too would Reuter. On the other hand, other sources will say he was under orders, unofficial or otherwise, to scuttle the ships, should the Allies make any move at all towards seizing them. Regardless of the exact circumstances, the result would be the same. Reuter became convinced the British were going to seize the ships the moment the armistice expired, which was, according to a newspaper he received, at noon on June 21st of 1919. Reuter would, as a result, put in place his plan to scuttle the fleet. This had been drilled and practiced by the Germans for just such an order. Flag signals went out, along with semaphore and searchlights. The first signal, to stand by for further orders, was sent at 10 a.m. on June 21st. The second, and the actual scuttling order, went out at around 11.20. By noon, the Germans began to abandon ship after running up their flags, and the ships began to sink beneath them. Hindenburg, of course, included. She would be the last of the major warships to sink, coming to rest on more or less an even keel by 5 p.m. And there, SMS Hindenburg would remain with her funnels in mass above the waterline, along with the bridge for that matter. The ship had sunk in shallow enough water that this was possible, around 70 feet or 21 meters. While smaller ships were salvaged, this battlecruiser remained in place for years. It was only in 1926 that serious efforts were made to raise the hulk. After the locals had, somewhat predictably, looted the low water areas of anything valuable, right down to stripping out some of the rivets. It wasn't particularly difficult to get out to the ship and board her, or to go into the areas that weren't completely flooded. The bits underwater, on the other hand, remained unexplored. At least until 1926, when salvage operations began. One man, Ernst Cox, had bought many of the wrecks in Scapa Flow. He had been busy salvaging the smaller destroyers from 1924 onward. This had been good practice, and he would put some of the lessons learned into Hindenburg. However, Hindenburg would prove to be a very stubborn wreck. Salvaging a wreck of her size, 700 feet, or 212 meters, and around 28,000 tons, was not easy. It was also practically unheard of for the time. The Italians had salvaged Leonardo da Vinci a few years before. However, that wreck had been capsized and was substantially smaller. 
It also had involved full government support in the salvage operation. Cox was flying solo, as it were, to the point of needing to cut into the coal bunkers on sidelets to supply his own coal during a coal worker's strike. But back to Hindenburg. The first and most obvious hurdle was sealing all the openings. No amount of effort to raise a ship would work if water just flooded back in. The Germans had been very thorough in smashing pipes and leaving every potential opening well open. Hindenburg needed no fewer than 800 patches to make her hulk watertight. This required extensive work by the divers. Twelve brave souls who spent three months in the dark and murky waters sealing holes, the largest of which was, evidently, an 11-ton patch. As dangerous as this work was, it was nothing on actually penetrating the wreck. This was 1924, so light sources and diving suits were bulky and primitive. Penetrating inside a wreck filled with seven years of silt and rusted debris was not easy. Cox would only allow two pairs of divers, his most experienced, to do the dirty work. Fortunately for all involved, those divers would discover a gold mine. In Hindenburg's control room, they found a plan that had the pipe arrangement for the entire battlecruiser. And it was etched in non-ferrous metal, so even after seven years, it was still legible. At least once it was cleaned. That showed the exact points where valves needed to be sealed so it was less blunder about in a dark wreck and more blunder about in a dark wreck while knowing exactly where to go. That detail is important. Even with this discovery and all the precautions in the world, it was still a risky business. One diver nearly died in the engine room when a wooden ladder got caught on his air hose. Fortunately, his partner was able to help free him and both men survived. It's a stark reminder of the dangers in salvaging a wreck, especially in those early days. Still enough work was done to make Cox confident in raising the hulk. Two submarine floating docks were placed on either side of the hull, along with two of the previously salvaged destroyers anchored to act as breakwaters. A dizzying array of cables and ropes and footbridges were built over Hindenburg's deck. All of this equipment and work was put to the test on August 13th of 1926. Pumps began to empty Hindenburg's bow, breaking it from the bottom, while the stern was left to rest on the hard bottom to hopefully remain stable, while the pumps were steadily moved aft to continue draining the hull slowly. No one, least of all Cox, with a lot of money on the line, wanted the ship to break her back while coming up. During this process, a compartment was found that had been watertight this entire time, and was, apparently, pristine on the inside. A local photographer was sent aboard to photograph the interior of the wreck. Unfortunately, I've been unable to find any of those photos. If anyone has some, by all means let me know. However, things began to go wrong at this point. Hindenburg was leaking, and leaking badly. The wreck had to be sunk back down, where divers discovered that fish had eaten the tallow holding the patches in place. Those were replaced with a mix including concrete, and Hindenburg was raised again, only to develop a severe port list with the stern wedged to the bottom. Cox had to sink her again to avoid the ship rolling over. That list had, after all, approached 40 degrees. Cox would make several other attempts to fix this issue. Over the next few days, the ship was raised by the bow and stern, either apart or together. However, none of these worked. Cox put it best when he said the ship was heavier on her port side. He believed that her stern was resting on just one place, and that induced the roll. In an effort to counter this, Hindenburg was lashed to a beach destroyer on her starboard side. That destroyer was then pumped full of water in the hope of acting as a counterweight. They also ran a wire to a second destroyer for much the same reason. This new attempt was put into practice on September 2nd, 1926. And in fairness, it seemed to work. Hindenburg came up on an even keel. 
So much so that an hour in, the same diver who almost drowned, Harry Hall, hopped aboard the wreck. He carried a British red ensign and tied it to the ensign's staff. Unfortunately, this didn't work out. The wire to the beach destroyer snapped. Hindenburg immediately developed a 25-degree port list. And to add insult to injury, a storm kicked up, including strong winds. As heavy rain and strong winds broke a derrick off Hindenburg, Cox refused to give up. He tried desperately to keep Hindenburg afloat, in the hope she could be raised after the storm let up. The storm had other ideas. The floating dock was battered and nearly sank. Not to mention, power went out, and even bringing in outside help was not enough. Cox was forced to let Hindenburg sink once again, the fourth time in seven years. Cox admitted defeat for the moment and set about salvaging other wrecks, notably Moltke and Seidlitz. This extra experience allowed him to make another swing at Hindenburg in 1930. By this point, the wreck was kind of his white whale. Cox had sunk a lot of money and energy into the operation and was determined to see it through. The first step was cutting off the masts, funnels, and conning tower to lighten the load and prevent the rolling, in theory. Then Cox refit all his salvage equipment to bring it back to operational condition. While this was happening, divers surveyed the wreck. Surprisingly, only 300 were wrecked, either by the storm or the intervening years. With newfound vigor as a result, Cox set about his task. Pumps were placed all over the ship this time to raise her more evenly, to the point of building cofferdams on her aft deck, to allow for cutting into the hull to put the pumps further in. Cox then took another salvage destroyer and cut out the engine room section. This was then towed beneath Hindenburg, filled with concrete, and placed on the starboard side to support the weight of the battlecruiser. It would seem being a destroyer in close proximity to Hindenburg's wreck was a bit of bad luck. Either way, Cox made his next attempt to raise Hindenburg on June 19th of 1930. So confident was he that the man stood on her bridge during this process. At first, it went well. The ship came up on an even keel. But when pumps had to be shut off and lowered into the hull, Hindenburg began to flood. Divers searched for the leak, and one man had his arm snatched into an inlet valve. Somehow this had been missed in all of the patching. Fortunately, shutting off the pumps allowed him to be freed, with nothing more than bruising for his trouble. When that was sorted, Hindenburg was slowly and steadily pumped out for the next two days, eventually reaching 17 feet out of the water at which point she suddenly rolled over to port, taking on a 17-degree list. And, yet again, Cox had to sink Hindenburg to keep her from capsizing. On the 11th anniversary of her initial scuttling, June 21st, 1930, Hindenburg went to the bottom for the fifth time. Cox refused to admit defeat. Another concrete bracer was placed beneath the port side, and on July 15th, the next operation began. This reverted to the original strategy. Hindenburg's bow was raised first to let the stern shift and settle into the concrete bracing. For most of the day, this worked. Hindenburg's bow came up to 30 feet out of the water. Pumps were gradually lowered into the wreck, where they began to pump out dirty yellow bilge water. Workers were able to penetrate into the engineering spaces, where they sealed any lingering holes. And by 3.30 in the afternoon, even the stern turrets were breaking the surface. Everything seemed to be working for once. And then Hindenburg fought back one final time. The hole began to sag in the middle as water remained in that area. There was a real worry that Hindenburg would either sink or break outright. But Cox kept going, either out of stubbornness or faith in the German construction. And, against all odds, Hindenburg didn't break. She did, however, once again develop a port list. A list that worried all involved as it approached six degrees. It was on the knife edge of ruining all the work. And then, as if finally conceding the fight, Hindenburg settled to an even trim. 
By the night of July 15, 1930, the ship was afloat and at no risk of sinking, at which point weeks of work to prepare her for her final voyage could begin. Hindenburg was pumped dry and fixed up, until on August 25, 1930, the ship set sail. Under tow by three German tugs, the wreck was sent off for scrapping. SMS Hindenburg's story finally came to an end after years of fighting back against the British, in a manner of speaking. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.